My reflection this morning is going to be relatively simple. And instead of focusing on the history or the sequence of events or even what each event means in the light of the other, I want to talk first about how Mary felt when she stood at that tomb. We know that the named disciples, the apostles that went on to form the church, were all men. We know that those were the ones that are frequently talked about by name. And we know that many, many times in Scripture, women appeared as just a woman from the place in which they were born. That's what Mary Magdalene means. It's Mary of Magdala which is a town still today in Israel. But there was something special about what Jesus chose to do. On the morning in which Jesus rose from the tomb, on the morning in which he stood in the garden, appearing to be the gardener to Mary, on that very morning, he blessed her by being the first person to see him in resurrected form face to face. And I never really thought about it before. I'm actually using for the next three Sundays now curriculum that comes from Orange, the curriculum that we use for our preschool and our children and our youth. And the very simple but powerful focus of this section is that Mary knew she mattered. And I want you to take a moment and consider if in your faith journey there have been specific and clear moments where maybe the world rejected you for one reason or another, when the voices of those around you seem to scream out every reason you were not worthy or worse yet, the stirrings deep within that somehow who you were disqualified you. And Jesus showed up and called your name. And Jesus showed up in the way that only the presence of God can. And by appearing first to Mary, Jesus speaks to her and God speaks to us. Mary of Magdala, she mattered. She mattered to Jesus in his ministry. She mattered to the disciples because it was her who went to share. Many talk about how Mary and the women were the first evangelists. But beyond all of the theology behind that, it mattered deeply to Mary. If you have ever been a teacher one who has had the opportunity to work with a community of people or of children, and you have seen one, an individual, a child, somebody who was always left out, and you've been the teacher that went the extra mile, God knows there are many of them now. The extra mile to reach out to the one who was internalizing the voices that somehow their presence was less. You've seen with your own eyes what it means when somebody else sees them, simply loves them, is present and able and active in their life. Jesus shows up appears first to Mary, and then, as if to punctuate the statement, Jesus calls her by name. I love the fact that it wasn't because Mary saw him high and lifted up that she knew it was Jesus. It wasn't because she saw the nail holes in his hands that she knew it was Jesus. It wasn't because he came wrapped in cloth that he had broke free from. It wasn't because he had some powerful word of faith to speak over her life. Mary knew it was Jesus. Why? Because she knew what it sounded like when he said her name. 
She knew how it rolled off his tongue. She knew what it meant to be called by the God of the universe. She knew what it meant to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. My grandmother passed in this COVID season. And one of the things that I miss most about talking with her was the way that she said my name. My grandmother always called me Jenny. And in most circumstances, I wasn't just Jenny, I was my Jenny. And if Edgar was around, she'd always put her hand on me and look straight in his eyes and say, this is my Jenny. Edgar would say, yes, Grandma, I know. She'd say, you better take care of my Jenny. There was a protective, powerful love, a knowing and a seeing. In the moments when I would share with her struggles or grief, she would rarely say anything more than, oh, Jenny. But I knew in those words there was so much more behind. I didn't need her advice. I just needed to know that I mattered to her. Mary stood outside that tomb and Jesus spoke her name and in an instant she knew it was Jesus the Christ, the one who really had triumphed over the grave. I want you, as we begin this Palm Sunday experience and as we journey through Holy Week, I want you, in all of the regalia, in the foot washing that happens on Thursday, in the cross that is present on Friday, in the nails you might touch in your hands, in the stones you might have found in your Holy Week bags, in everything that tells the story, I don't want us to miss that each one of us matters. And Jesus was intentional and specific to always find us in the moments when we most believed we didn't matter. You know how in the movies there's often this image of somebody walking through a crowd and seeing Somebody far away, eyes downcast or quiet or not included or not the same, and there is this moment of seeing, and in that seeing, there becomes a knowing, and in that knowing, there is a love that is deeply transformative. That's the kind of love that Jesus the Christ has for each one of us. And we're walking through a time in history when we have forgotten the sacredness in each one of us, when we have lost the ability to look deep in eyes and remember that the one whom you behold is beloved of the God that made them. We're living in a context where we seem to be re-struggling, that every vote and every voice matters in a context in which our conversations have become so conflictual that nobody walks away feeling heard or valued. And Jesus showed up outside that tomb, and he showed up first to Mary, Mary of Magdala, the one many assumed to have been a prostitute, but. Any woman who wasn't tied to a man would have been supposed to be that. It's not even proven that she was. Mary of Magdala, the one that wasn't among the 12 that were chosen, Mary of Magdala, Mary is the one who stands outside of the tomb and somehow God makes a statement. Every single person you put on the margins is the person I appear to first the person that I appear to first. In the Philippians 2 passage, and this, this other juxtaposition to me is so powerful, this Palm Sunday. I don't know about you, but I've been accused of being a Holy Week dork 
so many things that I love about this journey, and there's something powerful about making this process every year, and every year something about the story comes to resonate in my heart more deeply. And this year, one of those things is the truth that Jesus the Christ could have come off the cross at any moment. I mean, I knew that, but did I know that? When we talk about obedience even to death, death on a cross is what Philippians 2 says. I want you to imagine God has given you and I free will, free will to say whatever we want to the person that makes us most angry, free will to go wherever we want, to use our money and our time however we choose, free will to <laughs> yield or to fight. Jesus had free will as a human being, and more than that, he had the power of God in his hands, and he chose to stay on that cross. He chose an obedience even unto death on a cross. Why? Because you matter. You matter, and I matter. There is a deep and powerful way in which the obedience of Jesus Christ writes with God's life how valuable you and I are. One of the gifts of yesterday, and I want to tell you, there have been so many people who have served this weekend. We had a viewing vigil and a viewing funeral and moved all of our food distribution and Easter celebration to yesterday due to the rain. And there are some of you, some of you here in this sanctuary now who know exactly what I'm talking about. There was a spirit of service that has been present. I told Eric in a text message that I read his grandfather's obituary <laughs> about everything that Grandpa Ben did and I thought, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> There's a legacy of service and grace poured out. But yesterday, I think one of my favorite things was to stand up on the half-circle drive, and somebody had the great idea. We didn't have enough Holy Week bags to give to everyone. So they said to me, Pastor Jen, you go stand up there. You take the Holy Week bags. And anyone who's brave enough to come ask the pastor for prayer, you give them one of those. I thought, okay. So I stood up there. Of the 12 cars that went by, at least half of them, when I asked them what they wanted me to pray for, the first word out of their mouth was gratitude. I just want you to to thank God. I just want you to thank God that my family has made it this far. I just want you to thank God for me that my parents in Guatemala or Salvador are still alive. I just want you to thank God on my behalf. Free will. And what did they use it for? To give thanksgiving to God. Obedience even to death on a cross, in your relationships with one another. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The fact that Jesus was God on that cross was not what he used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, took the nature of a servant being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of man, and he humbled himself. He humbled himself, obedient to death, even death on a cross, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and in earth. This week, my heart has gotten a little crazy in moments. And I think part of it comes from being tired and part of it comes from all that's happening with the move to reopening. And I don't think I'm the only one. Some of those who stopped to ask for prayer said to me, I, I just, it's just harder now than it was a year ago. Pray that I can hold on. And I feel that in my own spirit, and I've started praying for protection of my heart, 
that I wouldn't take so deeply and personally whatever comes, that I would somehow be able to be focused on God and to know that beyond everything that happens, and this is in the Sunday school curriculum for the teens, beyond what everybody else thinks about whether you matter and whether your ego wants to be fed by somebody else's analysis of whether you've done it well or right or good enough, regardless of all of that, you and I matter to God. We matter. And the humility with, with which Christ gave his life is the way in which we are invited to rest, to rest, not to strive, to rest in the grace of God. He called her name. He called her name after having been obedient to death on the cross and in so doing told her that she mattered. Pastor Tammy sent me pictures yesterday of Debbie and Hunter and Marcela Sarai, who worked tirelessly this week to prepare Easter bags of more than 100 kids at Cider Mill going to get food. And we gave them little Easter bags with palms, but more than bright colored eggs and chocolate candy. I pray that the presence of people there tells them something about what it means to matter, to be seen, to not be forgotten, to be beloved, to be worth the sacrifice of God on the cross. I'll close with this. Somebody was telling me this week, <laughs> telling me this week that at the foot of the cross, nobody's first. Nobody matters more. <laughs> and that's the power of what Jesus does. You matter, I matter, but we matter the same. Nobody gets first in line because they were a better Christian. Nobody gets closer because they sacrificed more. Nobody gets to be the one that is most beloved. There is this extraordinary way of God to be in all places at all times and yet to know your name and mine. And at the foot of the cross, we are all redeemed by his grace. Center your heart. Push back the voices that would pierce your heart so deeply you would start to believe that you don't matter to God and hear him call your name and see him stay on the cross for your life and for mine and live in such a way that others know they matter because you see them. Because you see them and love them and walk with them and are true to them because God is true to you.